this makes headlines whatever i'm going to say right now and i've been in the wrong side of it in the right side of it but i'll again say it. so i assume that chennai will pick me because i was from chennai rcb fans are loyal sash they are actually family and one of my regrets in my uh, cricketing career it was the fact that i didn't want to get retained in 2013 if i had to rewind that Hi hello and welcome back to Kutti Stories with Ash brought to you by Peter England. Uh this is an IPL special. Uh, we all know IPL as a summer tournament where we get entertained. Uh but it's also a tournament that's produced a lot of wonderful cricketers and also produced a stage for many Indian cricketers to come through and express themselves. We've got somebody today who's not just a cricketer, not just a commentator, but something beyond all of this. He's done some wonderful things on the field. He is one of those cricketers who's not missed any one of edition of the IPL. He's played all the 16 editions, missed just two games. Uh we have Dinesh Karthik on the show. Thank you so much Dinesh for doing this. Uh how does it feel to be here? Very good. First of all, I've uh, always watched all these shows, so to be part of this is uh, something that's very happy in uh, on a personal front and um, that's it's very interesting that you say that I've played 16 seasons of IPL. It's just gone and flown through like a breeze, so Uh, one more season beckons but it's been a very very interesting journey so far right dinesh uh, when we have conversations away from the camera it's a lot more easier uh, we we do a lot of banter some of those cannot be brought in front of the camera uh, but today i'm going to just make it a lot more easier for you so that you understand what's coming your way some bouncers some yorkers you can obviously <laughs> paddle sweep them uh, but i've divided divided the whole show into three segments uh, the first one is reminisce with ash where we'll be talking free willingly about uh the IPL and how the IPL actually originated if you look at it it's been quite an interesting turn of events and uh, then you'll have a question there's a lot of spirit of cricket being thrown in something precisely towards the spirit of cricket and the gentleman nature of the game and finally DRS with Ash where I'll put you on the spot some very quick rapid fire questions coming your way um so we'll head into it first up reminisce with Ash I'm going to say that Dinesh I want to start right way back in 2007. Uh you guys won the T20 World Cup. On the way back you were on an open bus. People were really throwing the flowers on you guys and they announced the IPL was going to be launched. What was your first reaction when they said there's a T20 league happening and you would be sold in an auction like a commodity? What was your first reaction like? So in the T20 World Cup nobody had a clue that there was going to be a tournament like IPL that's around the corner. But you could see the kind of craze that happened popularity i'll tell you uh, there's this song uh, movie that had released at that stage shahrukh khan's movie and the chakte india song just became too popular at that stage almost throughout the world cup they kept playing it you've been part of many indian teams and you know how it is during a world cup where you know you come down from the hotel into the hotel lobby and there are millions of people and it was very similar to that craze for cricket and that t20 was a bit of a novelty at that stage look i think I, up, up until that point none of the teams took it very seriously they used to be bilaterals when they played test cricket they played odi cricket but through that in the middle they'll just play the odd uh, t20 game they used to have all these nicknames australia used to have all these <laughs> nicknames i used to remember gilchrist had this nickname called churchy behind his shirt and simons it used to be roy punter so they never took it as seriously as it is today for sure understandably so because i think the, a lot of the importance was given to the test format and the odi format but what stood out during that tournament was as the tournament kept progressing there was a league stage where people played it but then as it got to the semi finals and finals you can see that there was a certain build up of crowds that was happening not just in the hotel lobbies but also in the grounds and the whole cricketing media covering it like wow there is something new here which is phenomenal so how did t20 get invented you know when they were playing the 50 over natwest blast tournament not natwest i think 50 over odi competition in england they realized that the most interesting and crowd friendly aspect of a 50 over game was the first 10 overs and the last 10 overs so they put both together and said okay let's start a t20 competition that's how it started in england and and lo and behold it became so famous the format and arguably one of the strongest formats in the world in terms of financially in terms of uh, you know people pulling i mean in 
games pulling crowds. So you can see that people have taken into T20 much quicker than any other format that has existed so far. And that World Cup was one of a kind, Ash. You know, I remember it was uh, Yuvraj Singh's peak at that time, the way he was batting. He'll, he'll play an amazing knock. Lalit Modi will come in the evening and, you know, uh, speak to us and then announce a certain gift for uh, Yuvraj Singh. And then uh, the next match he went, did something even better. <laughs> he'll come back, he'll upgrade the gift on what he is given. So, the, the, the kind of excitement and energy that was happening during that World Cup, T20 World Cup, was uh, one of a kind. I don't think any World Cup has had that kind of feelings. And I've speak, spoken to people who have played both the World Cups and they say that T 2007 World Cup was a, was a completely different kettle of fish for two reasons. One, the format. Two, at the start of the year, we had played the 2007 50-0 World Cup in West Indies, which was an abject failure. We didn't qualify and as you would know, uh, that led to many changes, even in ICC figuring out how the format needs to change <laughs> for uh, you know True. other teams to also uh, have an opportunity. So, that was a very emotional time for Indian cricket. You know, there were big players who were dropped after the World Cup and then they were all making comebacks, the likes of Seva, the likes of, you know, Harbhajan Singh and, and, and all of that culminated into this one massive tournament called IPL that started a few months later, but it was quite the tournament. Wow, okay. That's, you started off with a bang. Um, you said Lalit Modi came and gave gifts and he probably... Well, what came, game, came and gave gifts, he announced, you know, okay. this is what I'll be doing and he... And he, and he uh, was IPL a part of that? Uh, no, 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 no. no, no. He, I, he was the secretary or he was one of the administrators at that stage. So, he came and announced, uh, you know, at the end of... Uh, I don't know which game it was. It must have been uh, the, the Australia game. game. He did phenomenal, the England game England for the start. Game. So, England game, he came and announced because there was six sixes. Obviously, it was uh, a moment for each and every person who had been in that ground, who was watching the match and who was part of that in any way, shape or form. That six sixes was a standout moment in Indian cricket, and uh, you know Ravi Shastri's voice behind it, and uh, all the things just happened before the fight with Andrew Flintoff. It wasn't a fight; it was just a casual conversation, probably. But that led to whatever it led. But it also led to Lalit Modi coming and announcing something special because six sixes uh, that Yuvraj Singh hit, and rightly so. I mean, he was batting. He's a dream boss. When he bats well, there are not many other better looking players who can be six hitters. And I'm sure you're bold to him, and you realize maybe as an off spinner you probably had the better of him at times, but. When he gets going, he can be a really hard uh, batter very, to Very, very through. princely when he batted it. That is the right word to Regal. Regal is the word I'd use for him. He was phenomenal. There are people who hit sixes. And then there is Yuvrat Singh with his back lift, who makes it look a lot easier than what it is supposed to. It's wonderful. It, it feels like I'm watching a cricket match on Sky Sports. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, I'm also in the last uh, six months, I'm, I'm used to uh, taking interviews of you and, and a few others, but it feels good to be sitting on this side and giving... Uh, my, my my stupid opinion for whatever <laughs> no, it's worth. No. Your, your five cents are very very valuable, Dinesh. Uh, look, I think we'll just get right into the into the center of uh, the thing here. I, 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 I've always wondered because I was never a part of that 2008 IPL auction. Like I was hanging around trying to find teams for selections and all that. But as an Indian cap player, you found yourself in the thick of things. You were in the auction. I used to wonder. I was watching I was watching the auction live from a from the Dulip Trophy venue somewhere. Uh, myself, uh, Lakshmipati Balaji and uh, Badrinath. We were sitting in the same room and we were watching this quite a crazy thing called as an <laughs> IPL auction. Before that, I watched on some Tamil movies and some Hindi movies where the guy would be coming and selling, you know, sofa materials, you know, tables, some linen cloth and then they'll just say once, twice and thrice. For the first time, I was seeing human, live human beings sold uh, on an auction to play for a particular franchisee. What was it like? Uh, do you remember anything at all of it? or It's a very interesting analogy you use, uh, human beings being sold. I don't know uh, how relevant it was to the, <laughs> <laughs> the auction. But I get what you're saying. They were selling cricketing skills to a certain of course, extent. Yeah. Let me, uh, okay, let me rephrase it. Cricketing skills being sold to team owners. Premium. At a premium, of you course. You've got to yeah. say that for sure. I, uh, so, for a start, when the auction was happening, and no matter what I say, <laughs> this makes headlines, whatever I'm going to say right now. And I've been... <laughs> In the wrong side of it, in the right side of it, but I'll again say it. So, I assume that Chennai will pick me because I was from Chennai. I was just assuming that. Absolutely silly assumption. I had no clue. V.B. Chandrasekhar was part of that CSK camp. Uh, you know, his memory always lives on for all the right reasons. He was, uh, he was a big uh, well-wisher for me and uh, he was part of that auction and, and I knew him well. He is the one who picked me for Ranji Trophy. He is the one who picked me for under 19. He is the one who uh, picked me for India A when I played. He was the one who picked me for India when I captained, when I played rather. So for me, 
he's always had a soft color. So I, for some strange reason, thought that, okay, V.B. Chandrasekhar is there, he's going to pick me. We were in Melbourne, Langham Hotel. Auction was going to start. Nobody had a clue. See, there's a bit of back and forth going at that stage with IPL players. All, all you guys are sitting, it was that... No, uh, we weren't sitting in one place. It was place. that India-Australia series. India-Australia right? series, the monkey gate issue exactly, happened exactly. and all of that uh, was happening in one side. And then there is the auction. So, you got to understand that at that stage, a lot of what happened back and forth was understanding the... the way players, sponsorships, how it was all going to pan out. Because for everyone, it was new. Yes, there was an ICL which just started. But that was a very different, uh, I think, different league, let's put it like that. IPL was the big boy and you knew that uh, it was going to be something very different to what the cricketing world had seen. Probably you could compare it to what the Kerry Packer tried to do in the 80s. Right. But it was something very similar. But this was of a much larger scale. Whatever talks happened was in terms of understanding, you know, how many ad sponsorships each team could have, how many ads each person could do. So you got to understand, whenever you see an IPL, you'll see most of them wearing the IPL clothes. That's, I think the, a lot of conversations were regarding that because people had their own sponsors and if their sponsors and their, you know, their um, rivals were on board as sponsors, how could uh, the same player, you know, uh, be part of that ad shoot as well? So these kind of conversations was happening. So all that came to a, I think, came to a mutual understanding and uh, things started and the auction started. I was out having lunch. I knew the auction was happening. But you got to understand it was such a raw, it was such a new novel concept that nobody understood sets and when your name was going to come and, you know, fast bowler, spinner and all that. We knew there was a marquee set at, up top which had the top players and understandably so. There was Ricky Ponting, I think there was MS Dhoni, there was, you know, all the big ones, Andrew Simons, Gilchrist, whatever. So I knew that my name would come much later and I had assumed that, okay, CSK is going to pick me. But Lo and behold, the first name was Shane Vaughan, who got picked for 450,000, if I'm yeah, right, at that stage. He got sold at a base price, right? If I'm base right. price or one bid or something oh, like that. He got for picked for RR. The second was MS Dhoni. And he was the highest paid player in that auction. So when he got picked, that's when I realized, wow, MS Dhoni has gone to that team. Where and I, I know I wasn't going to be part going? of that. Yeah. yeah, because both of us were part of the Indian team. Both of us were part of the one day team, T20 team and uh, the test team at that stage. And uh, obviously, I'm always an understudy. So I knew that they wouldn't be picking me in the same team because obviously they'll use those resources in terms of money to another player. So that's when I realized, OK, so I'm not going to be part of CSK. And, uh, you know, and uh, from then on, the, the whole next four hours that actually um, happened was all about each player going to which team and at that stage Deccan Chargers and, uh, and your, I think your, KKR your story, looks your story, strong. story is really fascinating but I have to really interject there and ask you this question. Every single city at that point of time that had an IPL franchisee had an icon player. Yeah. And you were the first and probably the foremost player that had come out of Chennai in those those times, in recent times and you were you were quite the, quite the talent then. The whole of uh, Tamil Nadu was very proud of having you there. Do you think CSK could have had an icon player at that point of time uh, because all the other teams had one. I think that also was a strategic decision because see, when you have an icon player, you had to play 15% of whatever was your highest paid player of that team right. to that player. Right. So you can understand who the icon players were. There was Sachin Tendulkar for Mumbai, Rahul Dravid for uh, Bangalore, there was uh, Yuvraj Singh for Punjab. Lakshman for Hyderabad. Lakshman for Hyderabad who refused to take it by the way. So that is a different story altogether. So. Uh, so, you know, if you put those names, I don't think I'd fit in the same bracket. So, understandably, they would have thought that we'll go for MS Dhoni. If we don't get yeah, MS Dhoni, then probably we'll look at Dinesh Karthik. That should have, that could have been the thinking. I mean, now it's too late to ask VB, but I'm sure the, the, he could have given us a clarification. And that man was very good at picking teams. I can tell you yeah, that. He, he had a certain strength and vision towards picking a team. And I think CSK will always be indebted to that man. But yes, so they picked MS Dhoni, they got him. And I think he saw the leader that he saw because I think he had a very close view of MS Dhoni during his time as selector. We both played, we both started together, MS and me, but you can see at that time, Ch VB was the selector. And it just became a stage where I was playing red ball and he was playing white ball. And, MS, and VB had a very close look at MS because he used to travel with the team and watch him play and whatnot and realize that he was captaincy material. But the 2007 T20 World Cup was the first 
an instance of uh, MS captain. Till then, he was a vice captain for some time. So, I think he saw the leader in him and uh, till today, it's uh, worth every penny that they've spent on him. So, understandably, CSK made the right choice and they built a good team. But you, did you, if you do look at the teams at that stage, just pure names, you would think that Deccan Chargers and uh, KKR stood out in terms of, you know, punter ponting. Your star value. Yeah, see, I mean, uh, Deccan Chargers had uh, Gilchrist and Simons and Rohit Sharma and a solid team. And on the other side, there was, uh, you know, punter ponting, Brendan McCullum, all of them, Saurav Ganguly playing for, uh, and Kolkata had uh, Ganguly Chris as Gale well. Chris Gale as well. Chris Gale, no. But yes, so they had a solid team as well. So that's how the whole auction process started and um, I, I, at a point my name wasn't coming because I think the bids were long and it used to be a long drawn out process and uh, I waited more than three, three and a half hours to even know whether my name was going to come. Then my name came and then Delhi Daredevils was the first team I went for and there also T.A. Shaker sir was there and uh, you know he picked me and we actually had a very, very good team. We were in many ways slightly smaller on, I can't say slightly, oh they all went on to become bigger players, but at that stage, they weren't the, the finished product that they became a few years later, the likes of Dilshan, A.B. De Villiers, Daniel Vettori. They were all good names, but not the big names that, you know, that not point. the Simons or Ponting that we are talking about at that stage, in 2008. So, yes, it was a good team though. Glenn McGraw was there. Mohammad so, Asif was there. Mohammad Asif, Shoaib Malik, but it was a good team. It was a gun sight. I used to think Delhi was going to, Delhi Daredevils at that point of time was the front runner to win the IPL because it was a solid side. Because I had seen you play and we had won the Syed Mushtaq Ali a year ago. Yes. You had a decent idea of what the T20 format was all about. We beat a strong Mumbai side with Sachin Tendulkar in it, Rohit Sharma in it. So those are the memories that I go That was probably the strongest Mumbai side on paper. On paper, that right. Was, that could have ever played domestic cricket for that era, let's put it that way. Very strong team. Right, Dinesh. I mean, uh, we have spoke a little, bit of the, a little bit about the auction. Now, I think it's slightly... Let's just move ahead because the IPL has gone on for 16 se seasons now. Uh, you played for quite a few teams. Yes. Uh, Delhi Daredevils, RCB. Let's keep Gujarat Lions out of it for a bit. Uh, you played for RCB twice. Then you played for KKR. You've been a captain at KKR. Uh, some wonderful memories at KKR as well. Um, what do you think of this team culture? Because CSK has won five titles. You won a title with Mumbai Indians as well. I forgot Mumbai Indians in between. Uh, that's one title I'm sure you would cherish. What is it that defines a team after having play for, played for so many franchises that defines a team that goes on to get a championship vis-a-vis -a, -vis a team that just goes there and misses out by a whisker. Is it just purely luck or is there something more to it? It's not purely luck. There is a certain process and uh, how you can probably build a team, a culture. But all of it is accepted by the outside world only when it sees success. It's as simple as that. Because if you do see, there is no one method to success. There is Chennai Super Kings, who have a very different method. And there is Mumbai Indians, who have a very, very different method. But both have won five titles. So that tells you that there is no one method to success. There are different roads. And all roads are accepted only if it leads to success. Otherwise, it is deemed as a franchisee or as a team where probably things are not as good as it should be. That's the plain and simple truth that I have realized. So if you had to pinpoint one area and say, oh, this is how it is done. I don't think so. It has all got to do with results. It is, at the end of the day, you're judged on results. And uh, you can see that's been the case because IPL is a great example of two teams having stark different processes, stark different routines, but still having the same number of titles. So it tells you that, uh, you know, there is a method though. There is a method about how to keep a certain team culture, a certain team environment in respect to wins and losses, which is definitely there. It makes it harder if that part of it is wrong. But then there is not one method to say, if I do this, then I'm assured of success. I think what you can do is do all the right things and then make sure that everything is in play and then you hope for success and it has to happen on a certain day. So, you know, that is how life is and that is how uh, IPL is. I think uh, I would be lying if I say that there is a certain method. And then if that is the case, everybody will follow that. Is Life is really contrasting. I got DK the wonderful storyteller on the previous question and I got DK the slightly spiritual version in the next one. So I'm going to dwell deeper here because when I used to go to school, right, my dad used to tell me, do all the right things and leave the result to God. right? And that's exactly what you resonated right now. But I would like to know something a little deeper. You've, you've not been at CSK, I've been at CSK. I, I understand what you mean by saying CSK's methods are different and Mumbai Indians' methods are different and both have five titles. So if you can... Tell me what you saw at Mumbai that really gave them the result or what is it that is outstanding at Mumbai? What, what is that one thing that you can really attribute it to? Because that season where you won in 2013, Anil Bhai was the mentor, if I'm not wrong, mentor come coach or whatever. Was, uh, yeah, and then Rohit became the captain for the first time. Uh, you guys were together, similar age groups. 
what is that one thing that you guys did and what is it that about that franchise that sets it apart from the rest up until then they hadn't seen success i think they had gone to a final in 2010 that was the yeah 2011 20, against CSK. 2010 and 11 oh, sorry 2010 20, it was 2010 20, 2008 9 10 third year they went they played in dy battle against csk which you played and you all won so they knew what it meant to go to the final so they have a method 11 wasn't a great season for them but 12 13 was a really good one for them um so, are you there in the uh, are you there in I wasn't 11? there in 11 I was there in 12 13 I was I was there but we didn't have a great season we qualified though 13 is when we won for the first time what mi does is provide resources in terms of practice in terms of any time you want access to the coaches any time you want to upskill your game they're always there creating who have created an ecosystem for you to become the best player that you can be I think that was their first and biggest learning. Can you give us an example? What, like you what can, you can, uh, you can tell me, MI that uh, you know, in between a Ranji Trophy match, I want to practice, and they, uh, they have a ground, they have coaches, they have balls, they have bowlers, they have side armors. They will give you every. They'll give you stay. They'll give you the flight tickets. They will give you everything possible to become the best version of yourself. So, when you do that, you are impacting the player at a very subconscious level to say, we care for you. So I think that's what MI does. Do they expect results? Yes, like any other franchise you would. But they're also providing you the resource to say, you become the best player that you can be. And then when you come on to play for MI, we expect you to uh, do well for us. If you don't do well for us, that's fine. But we have give you, you have a much better chance of improving your game, improving your skill sets, and then competing in IPL, where you know as a team we do well. And they help do that to each and every person. And uh, they've created a nice ecosystem. And uh, you can see that they have a ground in uh, Gansoli, which is beautiful. They have wickets for you. They have, they have, as I said, they have balls. You got to understand, when I say balls, it might sound frivolous. Each Kukubara ball is 15,000 rupees. rupees. When you play with a Kukubara ball, it is very different playing with any other cricket ball. So to provide 20, 30 balls is 3 lakhs of practice session. Three, four lakhs of practice session. So you know, financially, they're willing to shell out to see you succeed and become the best version of yourself. And in that, if you can impact Mumbai Indians and do well, why not? And I, and I really like that culture where they were open to me coming and practicing whenever I required, whatever I required at any point of time. And I think they did. They were front runners in that many ways in trying to uh, provide an ecosystem to help you grow as a player, not only in the white ball format, but in any format that you choose to. And I think that uh, resonated well with me, and I really did well for them. And if you had to actually ask me one of my regrets in my uh, cricketing career, it was the fact that I didn't want to get retained in 2013. If I had to rewind that whole thing and go back, and, and that is when I think sometimes as a young player, you need uh, someone as a life coach. If I had had Abhishek Nair at that stage, I know he would have said, play for Mumbai Indians. I, 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 I don't have too many regrets in life. I'm not that kind of a person. But uh, if I have two regrets in my cricketing career in terms of IPL, one would be the fact that uh, I chose not to get retained because I thought MI was a team that could have really helped me grow and become an even better player. Number two would be the fact that obviously I couldn't represent CSK so far. But that I understand though. It's a regret because I couldn't play. I mean, coming from Chennai, playing all my cricket there, and I would have loved to be part of the yellow jersey. But it is... Only the fa but I always respect them because they genuinely try every year to try and get me in the option, and uh, you know that's all they can. Yeah, they were bidding the last time as well. They were bidding yeah, the last. And, time and that's well. all you can expect. So you know these are my only two regrets, so to say. But I mean, it is. Uh, it's not. It's not very far. Bangalore is pretty close by. It's uh, probably a five-hour drive from Chennai, and when you walked out as a finisher for RCB, that uh, I'm sure Sachin Tendulkar once mentioned on his final test that Sachin, Sachin, that voice will keep ringing in my ear till the last breath. I remember that one phase where you played for RCB as the finisher. And then every time you walked out to the center, it was like DK, DK sort of a feeling. And, uh, and it happens consistently at the Chinnoswami, right? And uh, the fans there are unbelievable. I'm sure you'd love that to be in Chennai as well. But talk to me a little bit about the RCB fandom and your role as a finisher. RCB fans are loyal, Sash. They're actually family. And I say that in good and bad way. The good way is when you go, no matter what happens, if I walk in, they will cheer my name and make me feel like I'm the greatest player on earth. And I think right now, you know, the young Shrayanka Patil, Ellis Perry are feeling it right now and playing WPL, watching them. I could just realize Smriti Mandana and all of these girls. But they are family ash. And what I mean by that is, to the outside world, they will never give up on you. If there is a fight uh, between, say, you know, some team and they say, oh, Dinesh is not a good player, they will pounce on that person 
and smash him saying this is the record, this is what he's done, that is what he's done. But <laughs> on a personal level, that same fan will abuse me silently in DMs every day. No, so rather on a one-on-one -on -one note, no, he will go hard at me if I don't do well for RCB, smash me. Not just me, my family, whoever possible in my life. But to the outside world, they will not give up. An RCB player for them is very, very special. And what a fan base they have yeah. for a team that is just competing for 16 years. Unreal fan base that they have. I've, as I said, I've been part of many teams and uh, you know all of them have fans, but RCB, incredible. A, a lot of it is fueled by also the, the fandom that Virat has. Let's be honest, I think they love the person and he has been the most loyal and faithful player to RCB, but also credit to RCB for building a franchise which is slowly but steadily becoming popular worldwide to say there is a team called RCB which has an extraordinary fan base and for me that just doesn't come over one year or two years. They've built that kind of love and affection over 15, 16 years and you can see that wherever they play. You can try to build fandom as much as possible. He, we were talking something, discussing about franchisee and how the players are looked after. We were talking about player-centric franchisees and stuff like that. And he mean, because at the end of the day, for most of these franchisees, it's business first and then it dwells into cricket and it moves on, so on and so forth. And he said, for Mumbai Indians, it's a pride project and there is no budget on any single thing, right? Likewise, if you take every other franchisee you have represented, there would have been different challenges. You know where I'm getting to, right? The home ground base. We spoke about Mumbai having contrasting methods, CSK having contrasting methods. But do you feel a home ground synergy, a control of the home ground to a certain extent for a franchisee makes a huge difference in getting the right results? Because you were captain of the Eden Gardens for KKR and you qualified the first year. KKR also is a very special franchise. And addressing the first part of your question, which is how important is Home ground. Control of your home ground is extremely important. You've got to understand that every team comes with a certain skill set and a certain strength. And that team in that home venue will try and win as many games as possible. That gives them the best chance of success and moving into the qualifiers. And I think these uh, Chennai and Mumbai have a, a lot of uh, you know, um, love and affection from the ground staff. And they're able to obviously get a pitch that they really like the way they want it. And that's understandable. And uh, you know, the results are there for them to see. But also, to be fair to them, I think they've also done well in tournaments when it's been in Dubai and all that. So they have a certain, a, a lot of other strengths as well. But the teams which are able to produce pitches and uh, which are able to produce pitches more suited to their uh, kind of team, I think obviously gets a certain advantage over a period of time in that given year without a shadow of doubt. And I think CSK and Mumbai have done that really well. KKR in, in my time as well, a phenomenal team, a very, very well-run franchisee, someone that I really enjoyed playing. I, I see a lot of myself in KKR. Venki Mysore is someone that I connected with in a very deep level because I used to have thousands of conversations with him and a lot of uh, love and respect for uh, Shah Rukh and Jai because I think through my times, and there were some tough times during that time, they really took care of me on a very personal level. So I'll always be indebted to them and uh, a lovely fan base as well. Uh, you, I remember playing for KKR, the one thing that you will get is in that eastern part of India, it is a different world boss. There is no doubt about it. And I've oh, played why? What is different? Game. So when you play in, in that part of the world, they are extremely passionate about you. What, when, when I remember, I used to get most of uh, my fans at that stage when I played for India, speak to me in Bengali. <laughs> I don't know Bengali, Boston. No, no, you should learn. You should learn. Because they felt that being part of KKR would mean that, you know, that whole belt of uh, Eastern, Northeastern states and uh, all of that. I could see there was a certain amount of, uh, you know, a love and affection coming from that state, which was very different to what I received when I played for other franchises. They're very passionate as well. No? And uh, Shahrukh Khan plays a massive part there. Like every team has a certain player that they resonate with. With uh, KKR for the longest time used to be uh, Shahrukh Khan. And then you could see then they started loving KKR as a team as well. And uh, it is good to see Gautam Gambhir, what he did for the team. I was feeling, I was stepping into some big shoes, but uh, over a period of time, I must say, I've enjoyed playing for that franchise even I did. We spoke a little bit about KKR and that's what, that's where my next question will revolve around as well. Um, Dinesh Karthik, the player, moved from different places, had a few regrets, worked on your game at Mumbai Indians. We spoke a little bit about RCB. You had two stints at RCB. Um, <clears throat> but KKR, your role was different. You were the leader there. You were the captain. How different was it being just a player to a captain in a franchise-driven sport? You've been captain for Tamil Nadu and I know how you run it. 
how different or what were the learnings of being a captain? It's, it's a very, very different feeling being a captain of a franchisee. You uh, have to understand there are way too many cultures and it will be very hard to connect with each one of them personally. But the, the only thing that you can do is be very honest with them. A lot of the times as a leader, the one thing I've realized is you will lose out on certain friendships and you will be misunderstood a lot of times. And uh, it, it's part of the whole uh, scheme of things, let's put it that way. But you want to be honest and you want to try and say things as, uh, as straight as possible. For example, during my time, Kuldeep wasn't uh, doing as well as he is today. So there were some tough conversations with him and I don't think he would have appreciated me at that stage. But I had to just be honest with him and those were some tough conversations at different points of time. But today to see where he is, I'm really happy. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with me. He has worked on his game. He's become the better bowler and he's become a world beater at this stage and I'm very happy for him. At that stage, it was one of the most tough. It, it was and is continues to be one of the more tougher venues for the spinners to bowl. It was at that stage an absolute belter. Those three, four years were probably the best batting pitch. Fast outfield, not the biggest of grounds. 200 was par. You needed to get anywhere above that to even compete. And uh, that, that's the kind of venue that was. So it was hard work for Kuldeep, no doubt about it. But also, I think those tough times is what made him the bowler that he is today, if uh, every cricketer goes through that. And I think uh, my bad luck that I had to be part of that time of his in his life. And, uh, you know, I just hope he understands what I did. I don't expect him to appreciate it or be okay with it. But I, and I hope he, he is uh, understood where I came from. And that's all you can expect. Just be honest with what needs to be done at that stage. Whatever, at the end of the day, whatever decisions you take, you're taking with the hope that it helps the team. And there's nothing personal there. And that's what you need to learn when you become a leader. You're not, you want to be as honest as possible, as straight as possible. But there are tough decisions to be taken. And you want to walk the walk and talk the talk by being as honest and, and driven in terms of trying to get the team to the place that you want it to. When you have honest conversations, sometimes it can hurt people. But one thing I can vouch for is that time heals everything. And maturity really makes sure the reality dawns upon you. Uh, anyways, I'm going to dive into the next segment, Dinesh. It's been wonderful chatting to you on Reminisce with Ash. Some great memories for you on the road. Uh, but the next segment is going to be a Gentleman's League question. Uh, brought to you by Peter England. In this, I want to address a very, very important topic. I'll just set the curtain for this. There is a lot of talk about spirit of cricket right now, right? You, you, you would have heard it, you would have heard it come up and spring its head and we've had a lot of conversations on it. So my question is, the test cricket and ODI cricket is contrastingly different to T20 cricket. Can we really slot in T20 cricket on the gentleman's league side yet? Is it a gentleman's game in this particular format? Because you had an episode with Harshal Patel last year and that's where I'd like to begin. Harshal Patel tried to run the batsman out of the non-striker's end. Could have been a match-defining run out of the non-striker's end. We can call it a tactical dismissal as well. But my question to you is, would you guys have held on to the appeal if he actually broke the stumps? Is T20 a scope to still retain the gentleman's sanctum? I think it's a very personal question, Ash. At this stage, what's happening is the world is divided a little bit. When it comes to uh, getting a batter run out of the non-striker's end, in a, in a bowler's run-up. There are certain captains who are okay with it. There are certain captains who are not still okay with it. My take on it is, it is legitimate. You are allowed to do it. So if, if I get run out do it that way, I am okay with it. If I am the captain and a bowler of mine does it, I will not, I will not, uh, I'll tell the bowler, it's okay, let's not go down that route. But I don't have a problem with people doing it. You get what I'm saying here? Do you find my drift? I, so, I, I just feel that, on a personal note, I feel what, when, when a bowler tries to run out, there is no harm in that because the batsman is taking advantage. So, fair enough, you go ahead and do it. I don't have any problems with it. But what I have problems with is the world morally judging that player when they do it. I don't think that is right. I don't think that is fair. And the spirit of cricket is a very grey area. There is nothing... What is the spirit of cricket? There are rules and there are and there is not a rule. I think the rule is you can't get a batsman out that way. So if you want to do it, do it. Where, why, now you can ask me, okay, if that is the reason, why, why don't you accept it? For me, what I think is, there is a certain skill in, required in trying to get a batter out. We will try and get the batter out that way. This is a lesser skilled way of doing it. If you want to do it, by all means do it. If, if I get out that way, I have no problem because I am at fault because I have come out of my crease. But if my bowler does it, I'll say no, we'll withdraw the appeal only because I feel we have a skilled way of doing it. We'll try and do it. 
But for all the people who are doing it, I have no problem with it. I, I think that's the stance that I take. Even as a captain, I don't, I don't tell my bowler, let's try and get a batsman out that way. So, but in, in, luckily or unluckily, in my time as a captain, wherever I've been, that dismissal hasn't taken place. But if it had, I would have withdrawn the appeal saying it's not required. But one thing, if the bowler is given a warning to the batsman once or twice, I don't expect it to be done now. If it has happened and then the bowler goes on to do it, then I will have a serious conversation to figure out what. That is my take on it. Look, I would have actually left it at that, but I've seen a few episodes, so I'm just dwelling upon it a little bit. The bowler runs a batsman out at the non-striker's end. He is supposed to be an asset for you in the team. When you say, okay, I'm going to pull this, I'm going to withdraw this appeal because it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good on the optics. Where does it leave that bowler? Again. Your cricketer in your team. So that's where leadership comes in, Ash. I think very much at the start, this is a discussion that's worth having, saying I, we don't need to do Mankar, but what we can do is tell the batter, if he goes out, give him a warning and say he has to stay inside okay. the crease. The ethos of the team is yeah. set. So I think that is where it's there. At the start, you set the ground rules. But what you don't do is let the bowler down at that stage after he's done it. So my thing is, it is not for the optics. It is not at all for that. I, I don't think there is any bad optics per se. I just feel that it is completely okay if somebody gets run out that way. I, I'm just saying there's a skilled way of doing it. Let's try and do that way. And I set the ground rules first itself as a captain. And that's what I've done so far. Whenever I have I've seen bowlers who might try to do it, I'll have a word with them say, let's not go down that road. But if you see the batsman going out, please inform the umpire. If he does it again, then by all means do it and I'll back your decision. As simple as that. So you, you're basically saying the ethos of what needs to happen needs to be set well in advance? Absolutely. Because I remember this happening. I went to Delhi Capitals after my year at Kings. And uh, Ricky, no, not Ricky Ponting, Ricky and Shreya said, uh, we might not be willing to do this, but if you do it, we'll back you. I found that very interesting because they were not in line, but they said we will back you because it makes you look in. You know, we want we want you to be in. You're a, you're a part of us. And interestingly enough, at the same year when I was at Kings and uh, Delhi came to play over, they came to me at the toss and they said we wouldn't run you guys out. Would you be okay not to run us out? We'll we'll take it as a pact, like how. Sometimes we do in tennis ball cricket, this is the boundary, this is the basis. I kind of, I kind of liked it because it was like, you're making the ground rules and you're not going to let anybody down. And I was like, okay, uh, but I would prefer you to stay inside the crease. And then we went ahead and tossed. You know, what I would like for ICC to do is bring a, a rule on this. You know, if the batsman goes out and if there is a run out, by all means, go ahead. In fact, go a, a, a step further and... Like how the no ball is checked every over. At the point of delivery, if the batsman is already out, I think uh, that ball should be clear, declared a dead ball irrespective of the result and everything in favour of that ball goes towards the bowling team. And once that is done, automatically, yeah. I think it will become very simple. So when they check for the no ball, the, that's the point of delivery basically. The point of landing and they check the point of delivery. If the batsman is outside the crease, definitely that ball, whatever happens in the batsman's favour, whether it's a 6, 4, that is nullified. And whatever happens in the bowling team's favour stands as is. So that way, I think the decision making is taken outside the bowler's hand and outside the team's hand. And in a matter of time, batters will stay inside the crease because they will have to. Because if every ball they are checking like the no ball, like how if a bowler makes the smallest of error, the, the camera picks it up. I think if this error is picked up and it is very easily pickable, if I can use that word, I think it will completely nullify the situation and uh, make it very simple for everybody playing. As a bowler, I'd love for a batsman to stay inside his crease and not take yards. And whatever whatever the decision that meets it, I'd be more than happy. But ICC has laid down its foot again and said, we are okay, it's illegitimate and run you out. And obviously, I think this question is going to keep surfacing. And but I, as I said, you know, where I have a problem with it is the morality aspect of it. When people judge the bowler who's done it, I have a problem with that. I don't think it's fair at all. It is in the rules, he is doing it. So by all means, it's right. But also what I would like, because the spirit of cricket is always hanging around the sport cricket. I would like ICC to take it out of the bowler's or batter's control and say, we will now see if the batsman moves, like how if the bowler oversteps, it's a no ball. It is a, you know, it, is, it becomes a, a, a no ball in a certain way for the batting team that whatever result in favour of them goes back. Whether it's a six, four, whatever it is. And not anything, that ball is deemed legitimate except the fact that everything goes in the bowler's favour. And once they start doing it, it's only a matter of time before, you know, it'll be So to you, to just wrap it up, to play within the rules is gentlemanly in the game. Is that a fair answer? 100% basically what is gentlemen's game at that stage when cricket was started it was started in England they used to have a cup of tea wear clothes and you know all gentlemen used to come and play the sport that's why it was called a gentleman's game that's where the term came up 
you know, and, and it's as simple as that. Today also we do that. We have a cup of tea and we play cricket. <laughs> only thing is become a we lot catch more. catch up after the game, isn't yes, it? Yes. Only thing is become a lot more competitive than what it used to be. Those days, WG Grace got out once and said, people have come to watch me bat and put the stumps back. So, <laughs> you know, that's where uh, cricket was. All right. Dinesh, that was a wonderful uh, segment again. I thought you gave it a... I mean, we had this discussion in, inside the dugout in Dubai, if I'm not wrong. That's where I prompted this question from. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's time I put you on the spot. Okay. A quicker round. Um, it's DRS with Ash, powered by Probo. And in this round, I'm going to ask you some questions. Five questions, which is a rapid fire, where I'll throw the questions and I'll give you multiple choice. You can, if after hearing the question, if you feel like you don't need choices, great. That's up to you. But before that, because you said, because it's a DRS round, you said I regretted the decision at Mumbai Indians of having to leave it. Which part of it and how would you change it if you got an opportunity now? No, I had the opportunity to be retained. And uh, I, I declined it because I thought if I go in the auction, you know, typical young boy who wanted to uh, obviously, you know, chances, uh, uh, time in the auction and I went inside and I became part of the auction. But I just felt if I had been part of Mumbai Indians at that stage, I would have grown and become a lot, I would have grown a lot more as a player because of the, you know, the kind of infrastructure they had, the kind of team that they built and uh, being part of the team that was led by, you know, Rohit Sharma, Panda Ponting was the coach and uh, the owners were brilliant with me as well and I had a really good uh, equation with uh, be it Akash or Anand and to, to, a, to a small extent even Neeta Babi. So, I had a good relationship and uh, you know, I, I just felt that if I had been part of that team, it, it would have helped me grow as a cricketer and as a person and, I, and hence when I look back at it uh, a decade since, I just felt I missed an opportunity there. At Mumbai, you were the best number three. You had a great season in, in 2013. And then you went on to become a finisher at KKR and RCB to a large extent. You've done everything literally. You opened the batting, sorry, you played at the top order, you've finished innings, you've kept wickets. You also fielded in an IPL game. Yeah, yeah. I'm yes, sure. you have. Quite a done it all. season when I played with Gilchrist. You, the only thing that you haven't done is actually commented on the game that you've played. That's the only and thing. Bowled. <laughs> sorry? Bold. <laughs> have you bowled in an IPL game? No, you haven't, right? You bowled in an Asia, Asia, Asia Cup T20 game yeah. against Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, so my question to you is. If I, ha I gave you an opportunity to go all the way back 16 seasons ago, what would you do? What would be that one thing that you would do? Finish, top order, probably bold a bit more. What would be the one thing that I would do if I went all the way back? Because Dhoni has finished all 16 seasons. He's been a finisher. <laughs> Call up VB. <laughs> <laughs> and say, why the hell? <laughs> Call up VB during the auction and say, is there a chance? <laughs> you forgot to call him then. No, you should have called I, I, it. I, I've never, uh, you know, thought about that. But that is just a joke. But given an opportunity to uh, play, I would. Uh, I think I've enjoyed the finisher's role the most. It is the toughest and most challenging role for sure. And you enjoyed it, and you do it all the 16 seasons it, given an opportunity. Like anything else, with success comes a lot of happiness, and uh, it can really take you uh, down uh, some uh, tough places as well when it doesn't go well because you have very limited time. You need to do so much as a batter to go out there and. Uh, you know, play those big shots and still find a way to be certain amount of, find a way to be consistent. Practice a lot to play eight, nine balls in an innings. It is. Anyway, are you ready for the rapid fire, Dinesh? Oh, I thought that was part of the rapid no, fire. No, no, okay. no, no. Rapid fire is with multiple choice options. You, you, have you been on Korn Banega Kroodpati? No, the finisher, when you said finisher, opener, I uh, thought that was option. Korn Banega Kroodpati? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have not been on, I have seen. Okay, so this is to re relate to the auctions. Um, so, who among these, I am going to give you four players, who among these players, uh, were acquired for the highest price in the 2009 IPL auctions. Shane Watson, Andrew Flintoff, Gautam Gambhir and Yuvraj Singh. Andrew Flintoff. And uh, which team did, did he go to? CSK. Right, okay. Uh, the next question, that's one for you. The next question is, what was the final bidding price for Jaspreet Bumrah in the 2014 auctions when Mumbai Indians beat Delhi to it? Uh, option 1, 2.6 crores. Option 2, 1.4 crores. Option 3, 1.2 crores and option D, 2.2 crores. 1.2. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, what was the final bidding price by Delhi Daredevils for you on your debut IPL? Do you need multiple choice for that? How much? 525. No, no. In Indian, Indian rupees. 2.1. Okay. That's 3 on 3. Now, the next question for you is, what was the final bidding price for Chris Morris in the 2021 IPL auction with a Base price of 75 lakhs. You need multiple choice? Or yeah, yeah, multiple. Okay. Option A, 12.5 crores. Option B, 8.25 crores. Option C, 14.75 crores. And option D, 16.25 crores. And this is a guess, 12.5. 
plates. Option D, 16.25. Wow. Do you remember that he went for the costliest uh, plates? I, I know he went for a big amount, yeah, but yeah. I didn't know how much he went for. And that was probably his last IPL. Last I mean. IPL, yeah. Okay. Uh, the final question, who's the costliest Indian to be sold in an IPL auction and how much? How much is okay? You can be here and there. Uh, do you want to... Costliest Kishan, Kishan? Indian player. Costliest Indian player. You want to wait for options or are you going to take it? Is it... Ishan Kishan? I'll give you options. Anyway. Ah. Okay, I'm trying to help you. Uh, option A, MS Dhoni. Option B, Yuvraj Singh. Option C, Ishan Kishan. And option D, Jasmeet Bumrah. 1.5 million. Yuvraj Singh. Oh. Okay. There was a I back think to Yuvraj Singh. Yes. And I think it was between RCB released him. Yeah. And, and bid for him again him. all the way. I think it's 16 odd crores, 16 odd. if I'm not wrong. Dinesh, that was pretty good. It was 3 out of 5, right? 4. 4? I got Yuvraj Singh. Oh, Yuvraj Singh also, right. Okay, I gave you the option. I gave you the option. Yeah. That's 4 out of 5. Uh, Dinesh, uh, finally, I think it was a very, very intriguing chat. Uh, we've had a lot of chats inside the hotel rooms and I've really enjoyed it. But this was even better <laughs> because I didn't think I can put you on a spot and still get those answers. Uh, so it was amazing. Thank you so much for doing this in your busy schedule. Uh, I'm sure you'll be going and practicing and uh, Andy Flair had a chat with you already on how, what you must be practicing on. So thank you so much for doing this, Dinesh. It's a wonderful. Thank you, Ash. Wonderful. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So thank you so much for watching Kuti Stories with Ash, brought to you by Peter England and Dinesh. This is a small little gift hamper.